You're listening to On Shifting Ground from Commonwealth Club, World Affairs, and KQED. I'm Ray Suarez. In 1997, back before the British returned Hong Kong to Chinese rule, the two parties agreed on a new constitution designed to protect civil liberties. Freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, and the guarantee of a free press were all enshrined. But the British and China also agreed the city would enact a homegrown national security law. And after 27 years, Hong Kong's pro-Beijing lawmakers finally fulfilled that long-overdue duty by passing Article 23. Article 23 targets espionage, treason, and foreign political interference and threatens many institutions. The Catholic Church has had to reassure its congregants National security doesn't trump the sanctity of the confessional booth. Foreign-backed media have shuttered their offices in fear of a crackdown on foreign interference. And even possession of the now-defunct pro-democracy newspaper Apple Daily could be considered an act of seditious intent. Critics say the security legislation will usher Hong Kong into a new era of authoritarianism, The dream of one country, two systems, is on trial, and so are its proponents, most notably Jimmy Lai, a Hong Kong businessman, media entrepreneur, and the founder of Apple Daily. Since the paper was shut down, Lai has become a symbol for the pro-democracy campaign in Hong Kong. How is his ongoing trial affecting his family? And why are human rights advocates around the world fighting for his release? Sebastian Lai is Jimmy Lai's son, and he leads the Free Jimmy Lai campaign. He's leading the campaign to secure his father's release from imprisonment in China. Jimmy Lai has been imprisoned in Hong Kong since 2020 and faces life behind bars. Jonathan Price is a lawyer from the United Kingdom who is a libel and privacy law specialist. Jonathan's international media defense work includes advocacy before the UN, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and other treaty bodies on behalf of journalists and human rights defenders. Sebastian Lai, welcome to Unshifting Ground. Thank you for having me. Jonathan Price, great to have you with us. Likewise, Ray. Thank you. Sebastian, for people who aren't keeping close watch on developments in Hong Kong, and that probably includes a lot of Americans, what is it the Chinese government says your father did? Why has he been imprisoned now for years? There's been a few different charges, but he was first sentenced for unauthorized assembly. And for that, he was sentenced on four separate charges, ranging from, I think, 10 to 13 months. And now what does that mean? So uh, in one of them, he attended a Tiananmen Square vigil to commemorate the people who were massacred in Tiananmen Square in uh, 1989. And for that, he got 13 months. It's worth noting that the only reason why my father is in jail is for his pro-democracy campaigning and his journalism. And because of the changing of the law, the implementation of this draconic national security law, they now have a tool to arrest him. Uh, They sent 500 policemen to shut down his newspapers, arrested his colleagues, and essentially closed the biggest newspaper in Hong Kong in the blink of an eye. Did he know that this was a risk that he was running? That this was a possibility given the way China was tightening the screws on Hong Kong? He's been asked that many times, actually, whether he would leave Hong Kong, you know, why he's speaking out, knowing that this could happen at any point. And he always has this good line. Your fear is the cheapest weapon that these authoritarian regimes have on their people. And once they make you fear, once they cow you, you can't do anything. So you, so for him, he just, you know, he just kept his head high and did what he believed was right, which was campaign for democracy and keep going, keep running his press in support of democracy and, and free speech. I'm trying to get an idea of the way time was passing as China was becoming more restrictive, as China was in an evolution, let's say, in its policies toward Hong Kong, did he realize along the way that this was a risk that he was running? Or was he surprised that, in effect, they came down on him? He always knew that was a risk. 
There's an interview actually by the BBC. Um, this is right before handover. And they asked him, because he had already been very vocal at that point for his support of pro-democracy, whether he was going to leave. You know, he's a British citizen. And they asked him if he was going to stay. And he, he thinks about it for a second and says, yeah, I'm going to stay until my life is threatened. I'm going to stay because Hong Kong's my home and it's my right to defend it. There's a quote actually that um, really marked me when I read it. And he was interviewed, I think, by CNN around 10, 15 years ago. And he said, for him, it's a question of human dignity. A human doesn't have dignity unless he is free. And so it's not a political thing to stand up for democracy. It is a moral choice. And that's why he did it throughout the last 30 years. And that's why he did it, even though he knew that his life could be at risk. And that's why he's still doing it now. Have you seen your father since he was imprisoned? I have not. I haven't been able to go back to Hong Kong. Does trouble await you if you go back home? I believe that I'll be able to go back, but I don't believe that once I go back, I'll be able to leave again. Jonathan Price, given the agreement between the People's Republic of China and the departing United Kingdom in the 1990s, given the changes made by Beijing in the years since, is the Chinese government following its own rules in the way it's treating Jimmy Lai? Yes, it is. It, it's not acting in accordance with the Sino-British Declaration, which was the agreement that governed the handing back of the territory of Hong Kong to China in '97. The British government itself has repeatedly uh, complained about the many breaches of the declaration since then by China. But um, there's, there's nothing, there appears to be nothing they can do about it. There's no enforcement mechanism built into the declaration. It's not just the British government, the, Uni the United Nations and many states throughout the world have pointed out the same lawlessness. At the heart of the declaration was the project that China had agreed to, where, albeit Hong Kong would return to China politically, Hong Kong itself would retain the same rights and freedoms that it had enjoyed under the British, including the absolute right to freedom of expression, the right to peaceful protest, and a lot of the economic freedoms. And these were explicitly enshrined in that agreement. Here we are halfway through that 50-year uh, period, and China has abrogated those rights thoroughly. And if it hadn't done so by the passing of the national security law in 2020, the recently passed Article 23, which further national security provisions in um, the governing instruments of Hong Kong d does it once and for all. Th there is no question now that the Sino-British Joint Declaration is dead. China regards it as dead. Beijing has said increasingly that it regards it as a historical document and it pays no heed to it. So here we are, 26 years plus after the handover. Today, is Hong Kong in law any different from Nanjing or Shanghai or Chongqing? Is there now a different system in any way that anyone enforces? Not, not meaningfully, no. The one country, two systems principle has withered. And as you point out, Hong Kong is essentially now just another city in China. Sebastian, after it became clear that unlike what many people hoped in the 1990s, that China was going to become more like Hong Kong. In fact, China was going to make Hong Kong like China. Once that was becoming clear, did you feel it happening? Did you know it was happening? Were you old enough to realize it was happening? Did you see it through your father's eyes? There was a lot of optimism, I would argue, mm. in in the uh, process in the 1990s. There were a lot of public and private assurances that the momentum was going to be in the other direction. What happened? Well, that is a, that is an essay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was born in 1994. So when the handover happened in 97, I was three. You know, the Hong Kong I grew up in, I remember that we didn't have democracy, but it was very free. As I alluded before, rule of law, uh, free press. And it was, by and large, a great place. People from mainland China used to escape from China to Hong Kong because of that, because of these rules that we had, uh, rule of law that we had. Um, and at that point, I believe we were, I think, 20% of the economy, of the Chinese economy, uh, um, and were 
we're now three percent. And I think essentially the belief was that as China was liberalizing um, economically, they were going to liberalize socially as well. Uh, now, my dad knew very early on that wasn't going to be the case. He knew that um, when they had the Tiananmen Square massacre, in fact, that's why he started his media. But a lot of people believe that. And um, I think China just found a way to have their market economy without having the democratic protections that are usually associated with such a such a market economy. Now it's pretty clear to everyone that in fact it is not getting freer and freer. And I think that Hong Kong is a litmus test how China views the rest of the world, the freedom of the West, and that's how they view it. Well, as it happens, I had breakfast in Hong Kong this morning, and I watched stylishly dressed young people drinking fancy coffee, uh, window shopping in extremely high-end shopping mall, uh, hustling to work on a modern rapid transit system on the first workday back after a holiday break. Unless you know, is there any way the casual observer would have any idea that Hong Kong is essentially different from what it was during the first years after the handover? I'll, uh, Sebastian, let's start with you. Hong Kong, for me, would still be a place that I'd want to go back to. It's still a good place to, for a holiday, for example, right? Um, but the truth be told, if you're selling your roots there, if you bring your family there, and the caveat to that is, is, is that you believe these democratic values, right? I mean, if you're happy living in an autocracy and just sort of putting your hat down and, and, you know, taking the knee when you have to take the knee and sucking up when you have to suck up, then, you know, this obviously doesn't apply to you. But if you're a person that grew up in a democratic country, or at least understands what a democratic country has and, and, and your rights, then I don't see why you would want to be in a place that literally criminalizes that. I don't see why you would want to be in a place that locks journalists up for the beliefs of the free press. It was a very special place that had the freedoms that we all took for granted. And within four to five years, all that is now gone. So yeah, I mean, you could still have a nice coffee, you could still have, have a nice holiday, the peninsula still has sweets. But I, you know, is, is, is anybody in their right mind going to move there? Is anybody in their right mind going to start a business there? I, I, I don't think so, unless you didn't have a choice. Jonathan? Well, I think it's not so much what you can see, it's what you can't see. The loss in Hong Kong is intangible, but substantial. And what you've witnessed, you know, young people, high-end stores, is no different from what you might see in any major Chinese city. And what you don't see in those cities and what you no longer see in Hong Kong is a free press. You no longer see people actively, publicly campaigning for democracy. You don't see the f well over 1,500 political prisoners in Hong Kong on the streets, just like you don't see the political prisoners in mainland China on the streets there. You don't see the brain drain that has occurred over the last two, three to four years now, the d dramatic outflux of young talent from Hong Kong. And what you don't see is that the young talent is no longer coming into Hong Kong. There is no parade when you leave town. You don't see companies announcing with a fanfare that they're no longer going to do business or support their outposts in Hong Kong. It just stops rather quietly. And so whilst the precipitous demise of the rule of law has been dramatic, its outward signs are relatively subtle. The institutions remain, the, the, the edifices of the court remain, but it doesn't mean that justice is being done inside, for example, as we're seeing in, in Sebastian Stad's case. Sebastian, do you worry about the risk that's involved in stepping up against the Chinese government, the, the public pressure, exposure of the ongoing physical abuse of your father, going public with it could easily make the government in Beijing dig in its heels even more on the treatment of both Jimmy Lai and the other political prisoners that Jonathan mentioned. Is a back-channel game sometimes more what's called for in a case of this kind? The short answer is, is, is no. 
The reason for that is that you, if you don't speak up, you just disappear. And that's the nature of these things, right? They want to make you scared. I guess it's like what my father said, fear is that cheapest weapon, right? They want to cow you. And once you don't speak out on behalf of someone, or once I don't speak out on behalf of my father, then he's open to whatever they do to him. Am I scared of what they could do to my father? Of course I'm scared of what they do they could do to my father. But I think silence is the most deafening cry of autocracy. Regimes around the world have tried to deal with people like your father by making exile the key that opens the lock on their prison cell. Would he accept that? Would you, as his son, see eye to eye with his decision about that? Or is your paramount interest having him safe and sound, even if it means being out of the country? In, you know, in the end of the day, uh, you know, as you could probably summarize from his story, he's someone who's very determined. Look, truth be told, nobody would have blamed him if he retired 20 years ago, 15 years ago. He's got a British passport. He could have left at any point and he decided not to because he decided to stay on principle. I do miss him. I do miss him incredibly. Um, and yeah, I want to see my father again. I want him to be free and abroad. Uh, but what you're referring to with the exile and whatnot, I can't speak on his behalf. Jonathan, who is Andy Lee, and what's his role in the Jimmy Lai story? Andy Lee was a young person who became involved in the political scene in the run-up to 2019 in Hong Kong. He was involved in groups that were interested in furthering democracy in Hong Kong, He didn't, in fact, have very much at all to do with Jimmy Lai, um, but he has cropped up in the trial as one of the prosecution's key witnesses. Andy Lee took the decision with 11 of his colleagues to flee Hong Kong on a boat, and they were picked up in international waters and taken to mainland China, where they were imprisoned and charged with various offences and where Andy Lee was almost certainly subjected to some form of torture. There is very, very good uh, evidence to support that claim. And Andy Lee was then, having served a sentence connected to uh, his escape from Hong Kong, uh, was then sent back to Hong Kong, where he has spent the last several years in secure psychiatric care, awaiting his own trial under the national security law, having pleaded guilty to various offences, he, he awaits sentencing, but also so that he could be produced in Jimmy Lai's trial to give evidence about Jimmy Lai's own pro-democracy campaigning. And that's what he's been doing for the last couple of weeks. The difficulty, of course, is that his evidence was procured both because he was tortured and because he was given a deal Uh, in relation to his own alleged culpability for similar offences. So it's totally unreliable, um, but nevertheless relied upon by the prosecution in that case. And the Chinese government is under the strictest obligation under international human rights law to investigate these very credible claims of torture, but has simply turned a blind eye to them. And that infects the entire judicial process in Hong Kong. Given an example like this, the one, the story you just told of Andy Lee, the way this contravenes international human rights law, is there any venue, is there any way to lever this out of a strictly Chinese context and into an international one? Or does it become almost immaterial that there was abuse, coercion, and violation of international law? Well, it makes any conviction unsafe. Any conviction based on such evidence is inherently unsafe. Torture is so offensive that it doesn't even matter really about the underlying guilt or innocence of the defendant. Although in this case, of course, the charges against Jimmy and I are are totally uh, spurious. But setting that to one side, the very fact that there is a very credible allegation of torture at the heart of his case should mean that the whole thing is set aside. Um, And that, that is a matter of international law. Of course, the Chinese will not do that. It's a real political um, 
misstep for them because it, yeah, this is the flagship national security trial and it's absolutely necessary that this prosecution succeeds. It will anyway. The Director of National Security last year boasted that trials under the national security law have a 100% conviction rate. Well, there's absolutely no reason to suppose that Jimmy Lai's trial will go the other way either. And Andy Lee is a, with great respect to, to, to him, is a bit player. He's not someone capable of creating a risk to Hong Kong's national security, either alone or in concert with Jimmy Lai, if he'd ever met him, which in fact he never did. So they didn't need to use this evidence. They shouldn't have done so. But having done so, as I say, it's a massive political misstep. And they will never be able to claim that this trial was fair whilst they rely on it. Is there any venue for you to make that argument? The, the argument is being made in the United Nations. Various experts connected to the United Nations are very concerned about this. There'll be a, an opinion by the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, not about the torture issue, but about the, the very fact of Jimmy Lai's prolonged incarceration at his advanced age. The, the real question is whether or not any of this will make any difference to China. China is traditionally quite sensitive about international opinion of it. They are very protective of their own procedures, and as I say, they're, they're pretty pretty sensitive to this sort of criticism. So it does have some effect. Whether or not it will have the ultimate effect and, and cause them to do the right thing, we will have to wait and see. Sebastian Lai is the son of Jimmy Lai. He is leading the campaign to free his father, which you can find under the hashtag Free Jimmy Lai. He joined us from Taipei. Thanks for joining us on Shifting Ground. Thanks again for having me. And Jonathan Price is a lawyer from the United Kingdom who is trying to steer Jimmy Lai's case through international legal venues. Great to talk to you, Jonathan. Thanks. Likewise, Ray. Thank you. You've been listening to On Shifting Ground, produced in partnership with KQED, with funding from listeners like you. Today's episode was produced by Matteo Schimpf and Andrew Stelzer, with help from Ryan Housel. It was mixed and mastered by Matteo Schimpf. Additional production and engineering were provided by Rob Spate. KQED's Jim Bennett is our technical supervisor. Jared Sport is our executive producer. Philip Yun is co-CEO of Commonwealth Club World Affairs. Our music is from Blue Dot Sessions. I'm Ray Suarez. Thanks for listening.